Wow. All right. So I didn't get a chance to do as many um, analyses of, as I wanted to, but I did have a pretty good start on uh, looking at the Airbnb destiny, density of California's population centers. Wow. So this is mostly going to look at the San Francisco area, LA, and then San Diego down here. Um, I've colored the, each of these dots represents an actual Airbnb location, and I've colored, colored them by price. So to get a better look at the price in each area, we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. And we can see that majority of them are down pretty low, but there are quite a bit that are uh, pretty high up here. So if you look at this one as an example, um, we can see this is in Beverly Hills and it's $25,000 a night for that, that location. Wow. So um, that's, that's quite a bit, but, um, but yeah, if I just kind of click around here, we can kind of see that, you know, there's a bunch of different options and, and varying prices. Um, I can go up here to San Francisco, wow. um, but yeah. And then yeah, the next great slide. use of the interaction and the uh, um, on selects uh, overlay texts. Uh, mm -hmm. That looks really, really good. Yep. And then the next slide, I wanted to look at um, that price versus the number of reviews and then the actual room type here. So naturally, mm -hmm. we can see that obviously the, the lower prices have a higher number of views, which just means more people that go there. But it's kind of interesting to see the, the as the price increases and we can see like where those different areas are at with the different uh, room types. So yeah, fascinating. Um, wow, this is a great data set and great visual. Um, there's two comments I have. Um, one is that for this visual um, on the depth axis or sorry, the width axis for price, uh, you do have the option for log, log scale. Um, okay. So for data like this, it might help reveal a bit more of what's going on sort of at the lower end. Uh, but I think that's amazing. And then on the second step, um, if you want to jump over to that one. Yeah. Um, the one thing I noticed was the, the dots seemingly above the map a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if that was intentional, but I just wanted to make sure um, you as well as other people were aware of the button or where that setting is. But you'll notice that by default, it actually is like hovering over just a little bit. And if you click on the edit button, which is that little pencil icon that will take you into edit mode, um, is that little offset from map. Um, it's um, right inside of charts. Um, oh. Yeah, right there. So by default, that's it's at 0 0.01 and if you set that to zero then the dots will basically be on the the map itself um, okay and so so anyways just like it's less about uh, <laughs> uh critiquing you and more for everyone else's edification um in case they've encountered somewhat of the same uh four maps yeah um, i didn't notice that and i wasn't sure how to fix it so i appreciate that thank you <laughs> yeah of course and then one last sort of uh and this is my personal uh design take is that for the connections themselves here, if you select the um, connections, that um, whenever you have a, a lot of density um, like this, um, one bar will sometimes obfuscate others. And so you can change the opacity of the color here. Um, I do something more like 60 or 70. Um, I mean, there's sort of uh, anything's available, but the uh, it's in the colors section. Um, and that opacity will essentially um, allow you to see through a bit of the, this, the, uh, the connections. And so it just makes it a little easier to sort of navigate and see. And, uh, but that's just a personal design preference. And um, yeah, <laughs> uh, no, but other thoughts, that. other you. takes. Um, uh, really awesome presentation. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Uh, did you get the map off our off our? Help center. Yep. Yeah, so the the map of California came from your uh, your U.S. states folder in the in the uh, in the Google Drive. Yep. Great. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. All right. Anyone else like to present? I'll go. All right. Go ahead, Hal. So I, uh, this is uh, really quick because uh, I, after last time uh, the presentation uh, uh, Bill did, uh, I think that was a really good way to learn how to create, uh, present, uh, visualize uh, uh, geographic data. So I just replicated it uh, in front of uh, my students to give them an example of this. And uh, so I expanded a little bit um, 
you know, just to for the homework. Uh, let me see, how do I share my screen? I want to share screen, uh, Google Chrome, and share, present, okay. Um, so this is uh, uh, basically what, oh, can you see this? Yes. Okay, so, so this is uh, what Bill created uh, during the last, last mm -hmm. week's presentation. Uh, basically the 10,000 cities and uh, it was uh, uh, the photograph, I think, as the, for the color of the map. And uh, I went a step further uh, with this to kind of aggregate um, the population uh, of cities into each for each country. So obviously China would have the largest population city population. Uh, so each country would have their own uh, one dot per country, like, you know, this. So, and then I went one more step to look at it based on, um, you know, um, different continents. So as the kind of see of, of Asia has the most population, Oceania, um, New Zealand, Australia has the um, least population of city in cities. That's it. Okay. And these are the continents that the 10,000 cities um, exist on? Yes. So there's 10,000 dots on that graphic? Uh, you know, I, uh, I created a snapshot. So this is population by, I aggregated uh, the- Oh, uh, okay. Based on, yeah. So that was, uh, yeah, that was nice. my next question is if you did aggregation in the tool or outside, and it sounds like you used yeah. the tool to create a snapshot, which is great because we're actually going to cover that a bit today um, in the, yeah, the snapshot. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, really cool that you, you did that. Um, it was quite easy to do. It just, uh, you, you drag a, a, a column up to the, uh, the title bar and it just does it for you. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll show something in just a moment here that is related to that. Um, but before we do that, um, any other commentary for anyone else that would like to present? Yeah, I just wanted to say, we love it when people take these flows that we put out there and extend them and make them, uh, more comprehensive or give a different twist to it. Nice going. Um, I'd, I'd like to present mine, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead, Henry. Okay, uh, let me get it up. This is from a data set that um, I'm a big fan of. It's the uh, exoplanet data from NASA. Um, so just start out with the field, like all these dots represent a star that we have found, uh, planets orbiting around. Um, you move forward, and they all congregate onto the globe. And this is all the locations of the observatories uh, that actually were responsible for finding these exoplanets. Uh, then we move on to the next one. And this is all the locations of the exoplanets in the sky around us. So like, if you look up at the sky from Earth, depending on where you are, around the sun, like this is the globe around our solar system that we have found exoplanets from. And then the uh, next step, uh, it actually has distance data. So uh, now all of the dots are actually arranged via the number of light years they are away um, from our location. So um, that's, that's what I have so far. I have a couple other charts that I'm still working on. Uh, this one's pretty good. This is all of the uh, single location stars that we found, um, or the uh, observatories that have found them. Uh, Kepler, which is a space telescope, is way ahead of everybody else still. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's and uh, so that's that. It's it's kind of difficult because the Kepler bar is so large. I need to find a way to like get it in screen and still have everybody else, and then. Um, and then this one I just started working on the other night. This is all, uh, or this is the um, kind of breakdown of the stars and how many planets they have around them. So like the larger circle is the ones we've confirmed one planet. And then I believe it goes all the way up to eight. Currently we found one star with eight planets around it. So uh, mm -hmm. that is, that's something I'm going to continue working on. I was actually working on it before this class started, but wow. I, it's a really fun data set. And it's always growing too, which is super fun. Yeah, where'd you get that data set? 
Um, just search for like NASA, NASA exoplanets. They have a great page with so much information. That's the best part about government agencies. They just put everything out there. So, Wow. That's incredible. Um, yeah, that was really, really awesome, uh, both from a content perspective, but also the visuals. The, uh, uh, the colors at the end, I noticed a few red as well. There was uh, green and red. Did yes. that have any meaning? That that did. I have already forgotten what it was, though. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Um, how did I do that? That was oh, that's the that was the planet numbers or no, that's the size. The oh, the colors were the system distance. That's right. Um, yeah, it, it it goes from like one point three light years, like eighty five hundred or something like that. So Got it. It's, it's, it's and a um, if I recall correctly, the visual where you had the the dist like the exoplanets a set distance away. You yes. actually still use the map function to, mm -hmm. to set those distances, right? So yep. I, I think what's I, I love this one where it really extends the idea of like what is the the um, a map here where it's the map of the Earth, but now we're taking it and uh, using those distance measurements to show something uh, as more of like a in space as opposed to a uh, dimension of like population, like how showed. So. Um, I love the uh, different ways maps can be used here. We've seen <laughs> quite a different, uh, quite a few here, uh, but I love that visual. And I don't know what you're thinking for that last one. If you're thinking mm -hmm. of like a pyramid look, um, that might be doable. Yeah. But uh, right now, I think they're overlapping. And and the one oh, yeah. little button, I'll just hint towards because you might um, encounter it, um, or it's it's sometimes a little tricky to find. Is within additional dimensions. There's a little field called direction, and it basically says in what way does it disperse vertically, horizontal, or through the depth dimension? Okay. So I'll just point you to that, play with that, and that might help help on that last step. But uh, okay. yeah, uh, that was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome, guys. <laughs> Those you. are amazing presentations from everybody. Uh, just kind of blown away uh, with the start of this. So you guys are starting the bar high for me to dive into hierarchies. And so um, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> That was really cool. Um, and if you guys are open to it, I would love to start um, sharing these with other, with more of a larger population. So we can talk separately or I'm, I'll probably email separately uh, just to get you guys uh, take on, on that, but uh, to be able to amplify and, and showcase some of these, I think would be well worth it. Um, so for today, um, we're diving into hierarchies um, and uh, specifically the one we are going to dive into together. Um, actually, close this one, is uh, related to creating a balance sheet. Um, and so I point to a balance sheet because it's sort of a, a very easy way to think of a hierarchy relationship, um, but in a way that you don't typically see a balance sheet shown. Um, and so here we have assets and liabilities and shareholders or stockholders equity, which should always be equal to each other. That's why it's a, a balance sheet that the number of assets should equal the number of assets plus or liabilities plus shareholders equity. And so within each of these, uh, this first view, you can see sort of the, the big picture in some sense, the, um, the hey Mike. Uh, full span here. Yes. Can you go full screen? Yeah. Is it, um, let me- I just uh, have you in your, in your uh, box. Sorry. All good. Yeah, let me, uh, I'll present this way because I know the text is a little- um, Yeah, thanks. Uh, small here. Thank but um, yeah, and so each of these outer components is uh, one of the line items. So goodwill, um, sort of the, the list goes through. And this uh, company is actually T-Mobile. Um, if I go more to the side here, and uh, we'll play around with some of the, the ways to, to visualize this and, and rotate it. But um, I thought some of the interesting aspects uh, to this, um, one were the, the really large values here on the asset side was spectrum licenses. So $82 billion worth of spectrum licenses. So the license for that area of spectrum that they own is by far their, their largest assets. Um, and where was the other one? I can't remember where the other one was or what the other insight was. Um, I guess long-term debt, but that's not too surprising. But anyways, um, what you'll notice here is one, there's somewhat of a, a snaky design here where we're using um, lines uh, or area charts to connect uh, these data points together, the height here is equivalent to the dollar amount. So it's essentially a bar graph on one angle, um, but it's also a hierarchy showing the relationship back to the, the center. 
Um, and so we'll show this through a variety of different uh, means, but you can also show this um, not just in a uh, circle, but also uh, vertically here. And this might be a little easier to, to see and understand. Um, and I can actually rotate this as well. Um, oops. Yeah, rotate this 90 degrees, and that also sometimes aids with uh, understandability. Um, so we'll go through basically the, the creation of these. Um, and one thing I'm just going to note is that it's a little more technical, but I think we'll, uh, in the process, learn quite a lot around how to actually, um, and it looks like this might have gone into an error state. So if your flow ever gets into a state where something doesn't look right, uh, I recommend refreshing the page, or save and refresh. Um, and that is typically an artifact of the preview window. This is a preview window of the presentation. Um, and that then when you go through playback, um, it's a, it runs the script again, but it's, um, anyways, sometimes you can get into a state where the preview window is not accurately reflecting what the presentation view will look like. So that does happen on occasion. So anyways, that's the, the visual that we're going to go through and, and start to, to create. And so this can be applied to a balance sheet, a cash flow statement, an income statement, a, a hierarchy of information, and even uh, to our point of, of being able to show all the different areas of flow. Um, so still sort of a work in progress and a little large, um, but these are uh, something Bill and I have been working through. These are all the top level areas uh, that we are covering. The flow homepage you guys have gotten very familiar with. Most of our work here together has been within swarms um, and different components of swarms. Um, we'll probably very quickly go through quite a lot of these other groups um, for images, text, and models, and sort of things just to, to check the box. Um, but we'll hopefully get be able to share this out with you guys. Um, and we're marking down what we've gone through already, what we have yet to go through. Um, that way you can sort of see the, the whole gambit of, of uh, what is available. Um, the one thing to note, and something I, I will acknowledge that we are still working through, is labels have a lot of nuance to them. You'll notice that the labels here are radial in, in pattern, where they radiate outwards, um, aiding in their ability to be deciphered. Um, but there are some issues, like right here, that you know is just because of the crowding uh, of information um, and that text wrap might be on. So we'll cover some of the edge cases of what we're working through. Um, but, uh, but how we think this is going to be unlocked is with templates, which are coming out soon, where, we're not coming out soon, but is something I think you guys will be more heavily involved in, where after creating some, a flow like this, like a, a hierarchy that is more detailed, that we can save it as a template that then allows anyone to upload data that has a similar format to reuse basically the perspectives and the colors and, and some of the other characteristics, but with a different data set to help someone get going. Uh, because as you'll find out, or as you'll see here, there's, there's a few components to, to building one of these um, that's important for, for us to know as, uh, as sort of the core designers here, um, but we'll note that uh, it will get easier with templates. So with that, let me actually start to dive in. Um, and so for this, first, let me reference how you can actually get to this data. So once again, going to our data library, um, we will be using uh, a training data set for T-Mobile. Um, so this is within your demo media and assets folder, which I'll place into the chat window again. Um, chat window, here we go. And... Oh, and Mickey, I just saw your message. Sorry, um, I'm so sorry we skipped over you. If we have some time at the end, let's make sure to have you present. Um, um, yeah, so just let me just finish this thought, but uh, we definitely won't, don't wanna miss your presentation. So apologies for that. Okay, so let me go back here. Um, yes, so I put that into the chat window. So this is gonna be inside of training data sets um, and we have T-Mobile financial statements and we have it saved as a Google Sheet so that everyone can basically look at this data first, um, as well as we're gonna use this to, to import in, uh, to, to look at a few things. So essentially what we have here is each of these is the line item on a cash flow or on, on these reports, um, and that each of these can be categorized into a larger category and then a subcategory and then the details for, for each, as well as we have this information both for the year 2020, 
as well as 2019. Uh, we have the dollar amount here in millions. And then I've actually gone ahead and multiplied it out um, by a million to show the real value here. Um, since when we have the auto rounding inside of our, our system, um, it's, uh, it reads this still as 82,000 um, as opposed to uh, 82 um, a trillion or billion. <laughs> um, so anyways. Michael, uh, is there any particular way that you're organizing that in terms of you know, top down? Yeah, so the most important thing is that this is a long data set rather than long than wide. And what I mean by that is that you could very much very easily also see this information depicted this way, where you have 2020 as one column and you have 2019 as a separate column. And that's totally fine. You could actually do it that way. Just recognize that 2020 will need to be its own swarm and 2019 will be its own swarm. And if you wanted to combine the two in either a, a hierarchy or to show something over time, that it needs to be in its own column. Um, and so that process is called unpivoting. And, and uh, if we get more into the data transformation, that's a whole, whole bag of worms that um, is a little outside of the scope for, for what we're gonna be covering, um, but definitely is, is somewhat necessary here. Um, but how you actually get this to this data is kind of cool, I think, is you can actually get this from the SEC website. So if you go in to the SEC, go to filings, you can go into Edgar and actually search, search for a company or fund name. So we can type in T-Mobile here. <clears throat> and once we open that up, we can open up the 10K um, and we'll see the 10 Qs. Make sure to click on the 10K and specifically open the filing that was made. Then, then click on interactive data. Um, I know there's a lot of like uh, clicks here. So interactive data. And then there's a little button that says view Excel documents. Um, I think it's kind of hidden with your system, but uh, that's okay because at the end of the day, you get a pretty impressive, or you get a document that contains pretty much everything you need. Um, so here we have the, the data and we have all of this on different tabs. Um, and basically we can use this uh, balance sheet uh, to take what is current liabilities. And what we would do is actually add over to it um, so that we have a column for um, category. Uh, so this would be assets. And then I'll create another call or one called subcategory, and this is current assets. And so what you're seeing me do is essentially categorize all of these, um, and I will not include the totals. So we would not include the totals here since we don't want that to be part of the aggregation. Um, but I do the same thing for liabilities. And I'm just gonna skip ahead here. Um, the there's also long-term liability, it's not just currents, um, but I'm sort of uh, skipping that uh, categorization since we already have the data. But I just wanted you to know where you can get it because uh, you could do this for any balance sheet um, and uh, lots of information. So um, now that we have that downloaded, um, what we'll do is copy over this URL and on inside of Flow, we are going to click on select slash upload. Uh, the loader type, we're gonna do uh, Google Spreadsheet and paste in this link. And when we import, we will import that data, that data in. And uh, we will then very quickly click on edit slash re-upload. Um, in the future, there will be a button called data transformation that will take you basically to the same spot. Um, and the thing we're gonna focus in on is snapshots um, because this is where we are adding the categorization or the, the creation of the hierarchy by creating groups. Uh, so there's little row groups here, and how sort of mentioned it last, uh, earlier, but essentially what you do is you drag and drop up to this little section that says drag here to set row groups. And so I want to drag them in order, so I want to have category on top, and then I want subcategory beneath that. And so within this, you'll see that there's been updates already, so we can see assets here, and if I click the the carrots, I can see that there's other assets and current assets, and I can explore each line item. So I've already grouped things together, and then I can perform aggregations. So 
I can take the real value and go to value aggregation sum. So now I'm summing up each of these line items so that at the uh, next level, you're seeing the additional amount. And so I'm gonna do that here for uh, value as well. <clears throat> and um, I'll skip through sort of the other ones. Um, you know, one other one we might do here, maybe just uh, for category, uh, no, I'm just gonna leave it like that actually. Um, and the most important thing to do is to click this create snapshot button. So after you've set it up, you wanna make sure to take that snapshot um, of the information. And so then now that it is saved in that manner. Um, the other thing you can do as well is sort. So just by clicking on a column, you'll sort it up uh, ascending or descending. Um, and that does impact the visualization and the order in which the uh, uh, columns appear. So from here, we've created a snapshot. Um, and so if I close this, um, snapshot is right below data source because there can only be one snapshot per swarm. You, can't, you can create multiple snapshots, but um, you can only have one snapshot per swarm. So that snapshot carries through to the different steps. Um, and I didn't cover this in the morning session uh, yesterday. And I, I, I realized I should have, but I wanna just call out sort of how this is structured by showing it first in a scatter plot, and then we'll jump into uh, uh, higher. So the first thing to know is that there's some automatically created fields called hierarchy level, which is basically one, two, three, um, based on where it is on this uh, in this data set where we have three levels, the, the top level, the, the sub subcategory, and then the actual line item. Um, and so uh, on the heights, uh, I'm just gonna put, um, I guess value, sure. That'll be fine. And then on the depth axis, I will put uh, hierarchy group. <laughs> okay, so hopefully this will start to make sense um, in just a <laughs> just a, a moment here. Uh, if you bear with me, so basically there's three levels of the hierarchy, and uh, maybe it's just to call out that there's a, a field called hierarchy level. I'm actually going to going to switch back <laughs> over to to hierarchy because that's actually how you typically create these. All right, so this is hierarchy, um, and it by default starts with a circular layout. You can switch that to a linear layout, which I think let's just start with here and then we'll, we'll switch to circular in a moment. Um, and so this is level one, this little dot here on the, all the way to the left. Level two is the middle and level three is this third one. And that relates to the data um, where if I go to snapshot one, this is level one, uh, level two, and then level three is actually each line item. So each, each actual line item there. So I do not need to bring in detail up into the grouping. Um, it's not necessary for to add the actual line item um, onto the hierarchy. Okay, so from this, uh, we might want to add some colors. Um, so we could do this in a number of ways. Um, one thing we could do is do a color scheme um, based on, let's do this based on category. Okay, this is actually a good example of where you might get confused. And let me just clear this up a little bit. So you'll notice that we see the first and the last levels, but are missing level two. And we selected category. And if I select subcategory, we'll see level two, but are missing level one. Because what we're trying to do is apply a color scheme based on the data that is contained there based, in, based on the subcategory here. Um, and Okay, and so um, if you look at the snapshots, you'll notice that um, for category, there is no category listed at this top level for assets or current assets. Um, um, yeah, and, and so the way to remedy this is to have these filled in. And so we can do that by going to value aggregation first. Um, and a little bit of a, uh, yeah, something to, uh, Small detail here that's uh, easy to miss, um, but um, but yeah, is something that you might encounter. And so now, essentially, we are coloring this based on the first one it sees, as opposed to being an actual representative of what subcategories are really there. So it is somewhat forcing it, as opposed to being uh, uh, truly correct. So I don't know if that all makes sense to, to everybody, but I, I sort of want to call it out um, as one way to uh, 
to do this. <clears throat> okay, so to help you understand what's there, let's add some labels. So on this snapshot or on this swarm, we're gonna click on new labels. And the first thing we'll do is click on hierarchy group. And hierarchy group basically takes all of the hierarchy levels that are not the last node level and adds the name to them. So this is whatever it was grouped on. So here we have assets on the bottom, we have liabilities and shareholders equity up on top. Um, and if I want to put labels on the node level, that I need to create another label object. And I can do that by duplicating this. Or if I go back to the swarm, I can also click on new labels again, and this will create another labels asset. Um, and on this label, I want to bring in the item, which is the very, it will only exist at the node level um, since item does not appear at the, at the upper levels. Um, and so you'll notice that the text is all running into each other and a bit difficult to read. So what we'll want to do is first turn off wrapping. This will make it so the text does not wrap to a new line. And then in addition, we might want to reposition this information. So we will want it left, cent left of the dot um, and be on the center of the dot. Um, and um, this, I believe, might be an instance where I just need to save and refresh. Um, so let me go ahead and save, Control S. And if I refresh, um, there might be something just going on with the preview window for labels, which I've mentioned have have a little bit of uh, stuff going on. So yeah, you'll see that it, the the font or the the labels are now re resolved. Um, and I'll space these out just a little bit by adding some heights uh, just to call out sort of these little components that you can start to intuit. These uh, account for the um, uh, measurements of the size of the this hierarchy. Um, both in width and height. And this is controlling uh, where you're placing the spacing of, of this information. Um, so the last thing to do here is to add in some connections. So what we're gonna do is actually add connections based on, I'm sorry, we're gonna click on connections based on hierarchy level. So it's a little drop down based on hierarchy level and that will create the connections based on those hierarchies that we assigned. Now, this is sort of, uh, I think, pretty interesting and, and uh, uh, pretty more, more typical for 2D view. Um, you know, there might be more you'd want to do for some of these labels. Um, some, some sort of tricks here are, are to bring it out a little bit so that it stands in front. And you can also add a background. Um, so if it is obfuscated, that you can add, make it a little more clear to, to read through uh, by adding in a background. Um, but the, the thing I wanted to really highlight here is I will add another step is that in three dimensions, you can actually use the height. So here, what we're going to use for height is that aggregated, um, and actually I'll use just regular value, um, in this instance. Um, but now you'll notice that the dots are offsets based on their aggregated real value. Um, and, uh, the thing that we've been sort of, uh, uh, encourage people to do is to create an area chart from this. Um, so if I click on new area charts, uh, an area chart is a little different than the uh, connections back to the uh, uh, axis in that it fills in between data points as well, um, in somewhat of like a, a same key kind of, of way where you're seeing the distribution. Um, I'm going to alter the, the size of this just a little bit here to make it a little less tall so you can more easily see things. Um, and uh, the one thing you might also want to do from this uh, is rotate it. Um, so if I rotate this minus 45 degrees um, along the um, width axis, uh, makes it just a little bit easier to see some of that uh, depth. Now, the reason I'm not going all the way to minus 90 degrees um, is that uh, at least for looking at it straight on, the text uh, sometimes or is overlaying each other. So we could have a whole lesson just on labels and, and formatting and stuff like that, and we might. Um, but I think what we'll mostly find is that by templatizing these and putting them into formats that really we know work, that should solve for the majority of cases. So that's sort of what we're banking on a bit more. And I think you guys are going to be more critical to that, um, as well as some ability to interact with this um, 
yeah, we won't uh, have you guys do it, but uh, we have uh, just to briefly show we have a, a node editor which allows you to create very complex uh, interactions where if I click on a dot here, it will cause other things to occur based on whatever I set up in the node editor. Um, that's for a, a totally different topic, um, and I'm not going to cover that, but uh, just sort of highlighting that that will be a part of um, hierarchies. So, um, you know, last but not least here, um, just to show how we can transform from one visual to another. If I change this from linear to circular, you'll see that the, the switch is pretty much automatic um, and that's, uh, yeah, I can sort of go from there. Um, the one thing I wanted to call out for radial text, or sorry, for, um, for these types of graphs that are circular is that um, this works fine when you're at an angle here. Um, of like, you know, 90 degrees or something where you can still read everything, um, but that you might, especially if you get into more of like a 355 or, or a full circle, that you want the text to radiate outwards. And so to accommodate that, um, what I'll do here is on um, this last line for label two, let me duplicate this and I'll turn off the first one. And on the second one, I'm going to click this little radial button. And I will also click enable rotation. And it looks better, but it still looks bad. And the reason it looks bad is because anytime you use radial, um, these radial buttons that you need to uh, set the position center center, and then you'll be at the right spot. And so now these are more easy to read um, and still face you as you um, rotate around the object. Um, and there's more we could do like I mentioned, but I will sort of pause there. So I know I've covered quite a bit here with hierarchies, um, as well as um, the root of hierarchies, which is snapshots. Um, and snapshots um, can be used both for that aggregation, but, um, and I realized this after the fact here, um, I actually aggregated everything for 2020 and 21. And uh, the reason being is that in that snapshot one, uh, year 2020 and 2019 um, are, sorry, are both there. And so I actually want to filter this. I, I'm neglected to do that. And so I can easily do that here if I go into year and just type in 2020, or sorry, uh, click the filters of equals 2020. Um, and so now this data set is only just 2020. And um, I clicked, I was doing that to the raw data state set here. Um, as opposed to snapshot. So uh, um, just a, a note to be on the right view. So to be on snapshot here, and then I wanna filter this to only look at year 2020. So now I'll update that snapshot and that should ripple through to then update all of these visuals um, and those interactions. So uh, sorry about that, um, but uh, glad you guys get to see sort of this in action. Um, so let me pause there to see what questions you have and what I can elaborate on. Michael, what yes. other, other than financial data, what else have you found this useful for? Yeah, so um, we also have seen it used, um, trying to think here. We've seen it used in an, uh, M&A transaction, um, where it's basically an org structure, like here's one whole business unit, as well as the geographies. So it was basically like finance, you know, like where does finance sit? Or like, sorry, the like an employee layouts um, or um, uh, interactive org chart. Yeah, interactive org chart. That's a, yeah, a good framing. Um, and that actually reminds me, um, and this is what I wanted to do quickly with um, um, uh, the information that Howe showed, because this is kind of an interesting use of uh, both maps plus hierarchies. Um, so if I just create a flow here quickly um, and select from that uh, 10,000 cities data sets. Um, so just from that uh, the sample data sets, 10,000 cities, um, that I can create a snapshot here that looks at, um, let's do, we'll just do country. Um, for now, there's far more that you could do here. Um, and actually, I'll put continents here. So we'll have uh, country and continents uh, update that snapshot. And so now, if I select that snapshot and add a map, 
um, and actually place these dots on the map. Um, so if I do this based on uh, coordinates using map one, and I'll select latitude and longitude, uh, that will work. Um, but the one thing I've had neglected to do here, um, and is sort of the, the interesting way to, to show this, um, is that we can aggregate this latitude and longitude um, based on averaging. So if I average these, I inevitably find sort of the, uh, the, the center, the geographic center, um, for the most part, there are some edge cases um, for each of these. And so what you can do is um, in this snapshot, if I change this to a color scheme based on hierarchy level, um, and uh, just for this, I'll also add in some additional dimensions, height based on those hierarchy levels. Um, and I'm going to invert it. So three, one, didn't work. Um, so if I do 0.25 to zero, <clears throat> this is the height off the map. Um, and I can actually go in still to add in connections and add in based on hierarchy level. Um, and I'll make the transparency of this more like 40. Um, but you can start to create these structures now, which are aggregating information and it's placing at a distance off the map based on something you're aggregating. Um, so the better thing to, to aggregate is something like population or something like that. Um, but now you're seeing the, the middle of each of them. So. This is kind of one of those things where it's a combo of the two. It's a, both a hierarchy, but it's also geospatial. Um, and I think that has a lot of promise as well um, for being able to show uh, aggregations. Um, so still a lot more to explore, I think, in aggregations, as well as the ability to interact. But um, we'll be very curious to see if you guys have other ideas um, on what you'd like to see that is sort of um, somewhat relational, relational data. It's a little different than a graph database, uh, that's for sure. Um, could, could you label that mm -hmm. center point that is the source of the hierarchy? Uh, you can. Great question. Um, the um, the only way to do that is to really add in a value that is a, a dummy value. Um, so if I go into this snapshot, basically I need a, a something up on top here, um, and so. Uh, I know this data set already and that I have uh, something called type, which is balance sheet for every line. And so if I put type balance sheet, that will actually now be the, the top level. And so now I'll see sort of a, a root node in the very center. <laughs> now, this is not quite accurate because this is adding the two together, which um, doesn't really work. But um, anyways, uh, I just wanted to, to quickly show you. Um, where you could do that. Um, so you, could, you could put labels on the uh, countries there at the top of those pyramids. <laughs> yes. There, right? Yes. Yeah. So labels here. Um, definitely. Um, <coughs> yes. Yeah, that's powerful. Thanks. Um, and so here I'm selecting country as the label. But I actually only want to label when it's when the column hierarchy level is greater than, or sorry, is less than in this case three, because I don't want it to show up on the dot level, but I do want it to show up here on the the country level, um, and so um, the other thing here is. Um, this is radial, and I want it to basically uh, be further away. And that almost worked. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm diving a little too deep into some more experimental here stuff, but um, but yeah, I think that's a, an interesting sort of uh, uh, use of hierarchies that is a little bit more emerging. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty common use case to label the highest level and maybe the second highest level yeah. in these hierarchies and not label the details just because there's so many of them. All right. Uh, what other questions do you guys have? OK. 
Okay. I know we ran a bit over, um, so I appreciate you guys uh, sticking on here. Um, I think the uh, that was really awesome. This was probably one of my favorite days to see you guys present. Uh, those were really awesome. Um, and yeah, if you guys want to create some AR videos with those or, or anything like that, um, I would be totally game to, to do private sessions with you guys to, to help record those or whatever. Um, I think that's awesome. Um, so really inspiring to see and we're available here to help you. Uh, homework is very similar here, um, where it's basically, you know, find some hierarchy data. Well, we can point you to this data sets, um, or even you could reuse the 10,000 cities like we just showed. Um, but, you know, practicing there, and you'll probably run into a few more things to ask about, I'd say. Um, so I appreciate your sort of uh, um, uh, uh, kindness <laughs> or understanding um, while we, we still make some hierarchy updates. Hey, Mickey. Hey, Michael. I had one question. Do you think next week we could cover how to potentially animate through data that has a time access? Yeah, great point. Let me take a note. Yeah, animation is a, a pretty important aspect. Um, the really short answer is in today's platform, the way we do that is to create two steps. First step and then second step. And the first step, you just apply filters to the date. And so it ripples in through that time. Um, and there's actually other ways to do it too, um, which we, we might cover as well. Um, but that's sort of the, the simplest way. And that the other thing to just quickly note, because I, I think it's really powerful and use it a lot, is um, in step details, you can control the amount of time it takes to go from one step uh, to another. Um, and so um, I'll just, you know, just put this into random perhaps and turn off connections. So if I were to, to do this as a, a movement of dots, that I could quickly change the amount of time this takes. You know, if I make it like 30 seconds, it's going to be way more dramatic and, and slower moving than if I were to make it two seconds, which is the default. Um, so just something to be aware of and uh, yeah, know how you can sort of use that. And there are some other details within this, just so you're aware, there is a little animation tab and there's some, some details here for ripple duration and item duration. Um, yeah, which we might get into. Uh, it's, yeah, might get into, but. Because uh, last week in Bill's presentation, he showed how the data dots splashed out to the various regions of the map, and I was like, snagging. So uh, uh, even if it doesn't happen in the class, I know it's capable of some really fascinating stuff like that. So yeah. if we can get an idea about how to inter interact with the timeline, that would be a real uh, Definitely. useful thing. Thanks. Yeah, animations were my favorite parts of the product, actually, for, for dramatic presentation. So that, that will be fun to present that next week. All right, uh, other questions? Otherwise, Mickey, I do want to give you the floor if you do want to present. Uh, no, or... I figured what I learned today about hierarchies would help me with some problems I was having. So I'm, oh, okay. I'm perfectly content to present next time. OK, OK, sounds good then. We'll, we'll do that. Um, well, any other questions or comments? Otherwise, we will close up for the day. I just, I just have one comment that I end up uh, closing out most of these sessions with, and that is if you are stuck or if you think there must be an easier way or a better way, reach out to us with a question. We, we've got a lot of, a lot of tips that we, can, uh, that we can provide to you. So there's no such thing as a silly question in this, in this, uh, in this space. So we're happy to help. Yeah. And to the question of <clears throat> getting, getting this flow, um, this will actually be a good way to uh, quickly uh, point to one thing. Um, so a few things in the share dialog, there's a little button called share um, and you can create a public link. So when I click that button for uh, creating a, a shareable link, this you link is like a public link I could send to anyone and they can get to this flow. They can't change the flow, but they can make a copy of it um, if they want to use it use for their own or to, to remix, basically. Um, you can also share it privately where you can put someone's email or if you ever have a question for any of us, you might be familiar, put in uh, Michael at Flow or Bill at Flow or uh, Anishree or uh, Jason at Flow and 
then it will be sent directly to us. Um, and then for some enterprise accounts, we have uh, organizations and some other ways to, to share, um, but just sharing the ways you can share. But the last thing I wanted to show was discovery. Um, so this is not used a ton yet, but um, we're hoping more will, is that when you click on publish for discovery, um, there is a tab on the lister called discovery. So if anyone wants to publish there, you can. Um, so you can take any of the flows that you have created um, and uh, publish for discovery, and then we can see them too. Um, and uh, we'll occasionally bring over some into the featured tab, um, but that mostly is monitored or managed by us. Um, and the discover tab is sort of open to everybody. So you'll notice there is one there called balance sheet from training, and that is today. So you can use that as sort of a, uh, a reference points um, for, um, for learning on your own. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for your attention and amazing presentations. Uh, really exciting to see the progress and look forward to next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.